Tom, I'm a nebulous games writer person who does a lot of different things, so I'm not going to try and explain. And I'm here to talk about Co-op and Betrayal. So most of the people here, that's not very special, but that's because there's a slight joke coming up. Please wait for it. Now, I've actually given a, a talk here before uh, on a very similar subject. In fact, if, uh, I've got a slide butler here. Uh, yeah, that's me. That's me about, oh, Christ, it must be nearly a year ago now, talking about um, a time I played... Sorry? Two years, Jesus. Um, <laughs> it was a very different place. Um, and back then I was talking about a time I played System Shock in co-op. And one of... Well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, because some of you might have been here. But let's just say one of my, uh, one of my teammates decided that they were playing for the other side about halfway through, and how weird and scary that was, especially when he stopped talking to us and would only speak in character as one of the many. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that today, I'm talking about this instead. <laughs> I told you there was a joke coming up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this talk is called Why I Can Never Forgive Ed Fenning. Uh, this is Ed. Now, this story goes pretty far back. It goes back to 2010, in fact, which is why I'm quite confident that all the young people here won't have heard this already. Um, 2010 was a very, very different time in video games. Uh, in fact, this is an illustration of how uh, different it was as I looked this up. And that was the year the first ever Humble Bundle was released, the very first one. It had uh, World of Goo in it because there was a time when everyone didn't own five copies of World of Goo. <laughs> The Connect was also released that year. I'll leave, I'll leave it to you to figure out which one had a bigger impact on the industry as a whole. So, yeah, this was a time when indie games were just taking off, having been invented by Jonathan Blow in 2008. <laughs> I forgot to put a slide in saying this was a joke, but thankfully everyone got it. <laughs> and transition from Xbox Arcade is where all the money is to everything must be on Steam was well underway. Uh, one indie game that wasn't on either of these was called Neptune's Pride. Ah, I was, the next thing I was going to say was, remember this. Uh, anyone, I was ask if anyone remember this, and apparently you do. Although it doesn't actually matter what you've answered because I haven't written two different versions of this talk. I'm just going to say the same thing either way. It's not a branching narrative. I'm not a Bioware NPC. <laughs> you can't shag me in an escape pod no matter how many times you hit the flirt button. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't remember it, which I've already assumed is most of you, regardless of what you actually just said. Uh, there's a reason that you've not heard of it recently. It's because people who played Neptune's Pride don't like to talk about it anymore. It hurts too much. Though if you played Subterfuge in 2015, that's very similar. Sorry if that's a bit of an anticlimax. Again, it doesn't matter if you were disappointed or not, I'm still going to say the same thing anyway. <laughs> Neptune's Pride is a browser-based strategy game that has destroyed more friendships than Kevin Owens. Topical WrestleMania joke here. There's a slide for that, Jake. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, that was subterfuge. I've already forgotten my slide. There we go. Now, about half of you probably laughed at that, and the other half have no idea even which one of these two is Kevin Owens. It's, it's that one. The, uh, he's, his, his wrestling gimmick is that he's a bad friend. Uh, <laughs> um, now, it's done that because it's a very simple, stripped-down strategy game with two very unusual design decisions. The first is time, which is... Um, now, Neptune Sprite isn't a turn-based game. It's real-time, but it's extremely slow. It's, uh, each game is meant to take, like, a month, and so moving your ships from planet to planet can take, like, seven or eight hours. This pro that journey there probably takes about five hours, something like that. Now... The interesting thing about that is that it is the perfect amount of time for you to set off your, ship, your attack in the middle of the night and for it to arrive before the other person has woken up in the morning. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what people did. Uh, like, a lot. There's no way to schedule movement in advance either, so if you want to attack someone in the middle of the night, you actually have to stay up until 2 a.m. and order your little ships to attack their homeworld. Um, and if you're coordinating that with an ally, then you both need to wake up at the same time to do it. And if one of you doesn't, then the other one is just awake in the middle of the night for no reason. Isn't that right, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. 
This results in a sort of nap chicken, where you want to launch your attack early enough that it will land before your opponent wakes up, but late enough that, uh, yeah, but early enough that it will land before your opponent wakes up, but late enough that they don't know they'll have already gone to bed and won't notice it coming. You can't turn your ships around when they're moving either. So once you've committed to the attack, you're committed, no matter how well you your enemy manages to reinforce beforehand. It also helps that we weren't all on Twitter at the time then, so it was hard to sell if someone was awake and whether it was on their PC or not. This information will be important later on. The second important design decision is that Neptune's Pride has a really interesting diplomacy system. That is, there is no diplomacy system. There are no formal alliances of any kind, no binding agreements. If two fleets belonging to different players are in the same system, they will fight. The only diplomacy that exists is in there's an in-game email system, and everything else is on the honor system. This is also important. You might not exactly see how these two ingredients conspire to ruin friendships, so the best way to do it is through the anecdote that I'm about to tell you. So I'm going to tell you about the Mother's Day War. <laughs> yeah, I named them. It happened fairly early on in a Neptune's Pride game, like a third of the way through. There only really been a few skirmishes, mostly when two players attempted to colonize the same planet. If you imagine the sort of awkward two-step you get to when you're going down the corridor at the same time, but at the end of it, you both draw guns and shoot each other to death. <laughs> Ed was the nearest empire to me, and we'd allied together a few times to attack a third party who was gathering power. And by allied a few times, I mean made plans to launch 3 a.m. raids that I got up for and Ed didn't, twice. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I got fed up with this and pointed my mass fleet at his homeworld. And that's when I got an email. Sorry, you've gone ahead of me now. Sorry, I was just gesturing towards the thing rather than changing it. <laughs> no, back one. Sorry about that. Just, um, now, at that point, I got an email. Hey, it said, and I'm paraphrasing this because the actual, word, word, uh, the actual wording is lost in the midst of time. This was seven years ago. Uh, I'm going on holiday for a week, so I'm just going to leave my, enemy, my empire on autopilot till I get back. Now, at this point in the game, we were all fairly trusting. So all the players together agreed to leave Ed's planets alone until he got back from his lovely holiday. Instead, I opened a second front against a guy playing from the US, which involved a lot of complicated cut time zone juggling and extremely weird bedtimes. Mostly, this was just a minor skirmish, though. Instead, I was content to gather my forces since my closest rival wasn't going to attack me. In fact, I was so relaxed that I took the day off to visit my mum for Mother's Day and didn't check Neptune's Pride the whole day. When I got home that evening, I found a massive fleet belonging to Ed Holiday Fenning heading straight towards my home world. <laughs> Let me tell you, emails were sent and they were not polite. <laughs> Ed's not actually here today. I thought he was going to be and I was going to tell you to talk to him about his side of the story during the break. Um, I believe his claim rests on him saying that he set the course for his ships before he left and he never actually meant to claim that he wasn't going to attack anyone, just that he wasn't going to be in control. My civilization should never actually recover from that attack, although I responded by, so I responded by revenge gifting everything I had to Ed's closest enemies. I was rapidly mopped up, and Ed eventually won the game when these two closest rivals attacked each other over second place. Now, let me tell you, dear listener, this betrayal affected me. I was no longer the naive, trusting young boy I once was. I was transformed into the bitter husk you now see before you. <laughs> It took a while before I could face anything like Neptune's Pride again. Seriously, it was at least a year before I could play anything even resembling it. I missed that subversion craze five years later because it was still a little bit too raw. Lion Helmet, the studio that made the game, put out a series of games in a similar format, including a direct sequel to Neptune's Pride. None of them ever quite captured the momentum of the original, possibly because none of us would ever be quite so trusting again. And how did I play these subsequent games? Did I extend the hand of friendship? God, no. <laughs> no, I lied. I deceived. In, w in the, by the time we attempted to play the sequel to Neptune's Pride, I took screenshots of another player's shoots and photoshopped it so it looked like he was attacking someone else, then emailed it to them. <laughs> then I did the same in reverse to the other guy. <laughs> they went to war soon after. <laughs> Yeah, um, it even began to spill out into other games. Uh, Sully and Furnham, which is a board game in which you all play as demons fighting to be Lord of Hell. It's a great backstabbing game, by the way. I definitely recommend it. I created a character with the Kingmaker ability, 
which is a very special ability that means that you can't actually do that much in the game, but you nominate one player, and if they win, you win. <laughs> um, so that's why I did instead. Simon, Simon Fun is brilliant, by the way. I highly recommend it if you don't mind faffing with Playboy email stuff. Uh, this trend reached Zenith a couple of years ago when during a game of Ultimate Werewolf uh, at a party, I argued so convincingly that uh, I was not a wolf that I managed to convince the room to hang my best friend who was in fact playing as a five-year-old girl. <laughs> I really hope you've played Werewolf, otherwise that sounds like the weirdest sentence. I evolved a strategy of threatening disproportionate cross-game retribution if anyone ever betrayed me. That doesn't work. <laughs> no one takes it seriously. So what's the moral of this talk? <laughs> Apart from that, the answer is, I think, the betrayal is a powerful and memorable thing. Hence why I'm still doing a talk about it seven years later, because it still hurts. It pursues you from game to game. I've never actually trusted Ed in any game I've played with him since. We've all experienced this, right? The guy you catch being a spy in the resistance a couple of times, you start to suspect him every time, even though that makes no sense because it's randomized. <laughs> what fascinates me, though, is the way people react to these games. Iron Helmets still make games based on the Neptune's Pride formula, and I assume they're making enough to get by, which must be difficult because the reaction of everyone who plays Neptune's Pride is, I'm never going to want to go through that traumatic experience ever again. Yet here I am still talking about it seven years later. Betrayal is memorable, but maybe not desirable. We love to hear stories about it, but we're still afraid to open ourselves to being hurt again. Still, if you haven't played Neptune's Pride, then you're still open to being betrayed. I highly recommend that you gather a group of people you currently love and respect <laughs> and give it a try. You'll hate each other afterwards, but you'll probably have a really good story to tell.